That's what I've got for you this morning. So uh, if you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's grab them and let's open them up to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23 is where we're going to be. Uh, you can open a phone or a tablet. Uh, there are hardback black Bibles under every chair, which you can open up to page 829, and you'll find Matthew 23 there. Um, I'll say this next week, those Bibles won't be under every chair. Okay? So if you rely on those Bibles, take one home with you and bring it next week. Okay? If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, is going to be a mandate in the new place, okay? Uh, so bring your Bibles next week, but uh, you, you, get, you get a little bit more time. Matthew chapter 23 is where we are. Um, we've been in the gospel of Matthew for three months now this summer, okay? We've done three months already. We've covered essentially a chapter a month, okay? We, we, we've done chapters 21, 22, and today we're gonna finish 23. FYI, July and August, we'll do 24 and 25, Okay, so 24 and 25, and then in September, we're going to start our fall sermon series in the New Testament book of 1 Timothy. Uh, we're going to do 1 Timothy together this fall, so that should be enjoyable. Uh, but, but let me catch you up, just because I've not preached for a couple weeks, so let me kind of catch you up on where we are uh, in the story. Starting of, uh, of chapter 21 of Matthew, uh, Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey to the shouts of praise and accolades from the crowds who are gathered for the Passover festival. It's known as the triumphal entry. It's a Sunday, Palm Sunday is what we call that. Uh, and that's Matthew chapter 21. It's also the inauguration of the final week of Jesus' life on this earth before he is crucified on Friday. So, so that's where we are at. The, the, the people are praising God and shouting and welcoming Jesus as a messianic king as he comes into Jerusalem. And then for the rest of chapters 21 and all of chapter 22, covering the next couple of days, uh, all Jesus does is pretty much tick everybody off. I mean, that's pretty much what he does. He comes into the, pray, the shouts and the praise of the people, and then he ticks everybody else off. Uh, he sees corruption in the temple, this corrupt temple, and he freaks out and starts flipping over tables, and he makes, a, the text says he fashions a whip. Out of what? We don't know. But if you can fashion a whip and then drive people out of a temple, I don't know how you fashion a whip. I don't know where he found whip material, but he did, and he drove men out of the temple. That was ticking people off. He goes back to the same temple the very next day and ends up debating the religious leaders all day long. You remember this, we took uh, weeks to get through this, but uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin, they all start questioning Jesus and challenge his authority by asking these questions, uh, question after question after question, trying to disprove who he is. But Jesus, like every question they, they attack him with, he parries that and, and, and dodges it. Like he answers and shocks them with his answers. So the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, they, they slink off to go and scheme a way to execute Jesus. They're done with him. They're done testing him. They're done asking him questions. They want this guy dead. And in chapter 23, which uh, the last two weeks we've covered, Joel and Kyle uh, exceptionally preached those, the, the many of these verses uh, the last couple of weeks, Jesus essentially goes on a public tirade and bashes the scribes and the Pharisees. It's known as the seven woes to the Pharisees. So that's what we've covered the last two weeks. And Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites. <laughs> He calls them hypocrites. He calls them blind guides. He calls them whitewashed tombs. He calls them murderers. He calls them a brood of vipers. That's snakes. So you're, you're a, a, a den of snakes. And then he calls them children of hell. You wonder why they, they wanted to kill him? It's for all those reasons. And today we're going to finish chapter 23. And the end of chapter 23 functions as something of a hinge, uh, and it ends in a way that maybe we would not expect. You see, all through 21, 22, 23, Jesus is ticked off. We have, we have seen his religious and divine anger in these chapters at an all-time high. There may be no point in the scriptures where we see a more angry Jesus than we just saw in the last three chapters. He's angry at the corruption of the temple. He's angry at one point and curses a fig tree. 
He's so angry with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees that he goes on public, he puts them on public blast. It's like filming a YouTube video for everyone to see about how much he dislikes these guys. This is as upset as we will see him. And I would think that now is the time for Jesus to pronounce judgment on them. That's what I would think would happen. He's angry. They've rejected him. So cast judgment on them, Jesus. Condemn them at this point. Condemn them to hell. And he will pronounce judgment. But it comes in chapters 24 and 25. He will do this. Chapters 24 and 25 uh, actually have been called a miniature book of Revelation. So Matthew 24 and 25 are all about the end times. It's apocalyptic material. So it's going to be a lot of fun, okay? It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, We'll get to that next Sunday. For our preview Sunday, yes, we're talking about the apocalypse. So, you know, you're welcome, okay? But for today... We're going to end chapter 23, and Jesus is going to move from being angry to being sad. From being so angry at the Pharisees and their hypocrisy and their misleading of God's people to lamenting over them. He's going to give us a lament. Jesus will lament at the end of chapter 23. It's almost a poetic utterance of his sorrow and his grief, and he will get to judgment, yes, but first he laments. So I'm calling today's sermon, How He Loves Us. How He Loves Us. We have three verses to get through today, and I only have one point. But don't get too excited because it's not going to mean a shorter sermon, okay? It's just less, okay? It's just less spread out long, okay? Uh, So here we go. Matthew chapter 23, we're going to pick it up in verse 37. Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. So this verse, verse 37, is kind of the bulk of this lament. It's the bulk of the lament and I want to point out a few things and then apply, okay? So a few things to point out about this lament. The first is that Jesus addresses this lament to Jerusalem, to the city. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. He, he, he talks to Jerusalem. Now, the way that the Greek reads, if we were reading this in Greek, Jesus is actually personifying Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem, he's not talking to the actual literal city. Jerusalem stands for the nation of Israel and her leaders. So that's who he is addressing. Jesus is referring to the very same Pharisees who are conspiring to kill him and the very same crowds who shouted his praise on Sunday as he came into the city, but who would turn on him and yell for his crucifixion a mere couple days later. That's who he is referring to, and he is lamenting over the state of those people. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And and instead of pronouncing judgment, he uses an illustration. You saw it in the verse. He, He illustrates by comparing himself to a mother bird and and Jerusalem or Israel as the chicks, as the baby birds. How often would I have gathered you under my wings? Now, this is a very common image all through the Old Testament. The idea of a mother bird or or a, a, a hen with wings and the baby birds or the chicks being gathered under the wings is all through the Old Testament. Hiding in the shadow of the wings of God is all through the Old Testament. So what what happens in those pieces, in those Old Testament pieces, is it's always referring to God as the mother bird and to God's people as the baby birds. And so what Jesus is doing in this illustration is he's, he's kind of saying, hey, I want you to know once again, I'm God in this illustration. 
I'm the mother bird. I'm the hen. I am God and you are like my children. And oh, how I wish I could have gathered you under my wings. Indicating, he says, how often would I have gathered you? Like this isn't a one-time feeling that he's having at this moment. This isn't a fleeting emotion. This is how often would I have done this? Meaning all through my three years of ministry, I gave you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to to repent, to come under my wings. How I wish I could have gathered you. But then note the last words of verse 37. But you were not willing. See, the main theme of this lament is the astonishing contrast between the deep love of Jesus for those who absolutely reject him. That's what this lament is about. Jesus longs to love them. He longs to love even the hypocritical Pharisees like a mother loves a child. But they reject him. They they are not willing. So so the illustration that he gives, it's, it's perfect. Parenting is perfect illustration here. It's the perfect illustration wanting so desperately to love your children and to see good things happen for your children, only to have them at certain times reject that. It's the perfect illustration. And some of you are like, oh, never mind. Never mind, not my little angel. No, never. Like some of you new, new parents, it's like, oh, I can never imagine this cute little bundle of joy ever doing that. And it's like, well, God bless your ministry, okay? Uh, <laughs> Listen, I know some of your kids like seem to come out of the womb just like smoking a pipe and reading Spurgeon, all right? So, uh, but that ain't happening in our house. It's not how it played out with our sweet little Harper, okay? Uh, Sometimes, listen, I love her. She is a great child, but sometimes it's like she doesn't think I love her. It's like she doesn't trust that I love her and I have her best in mind and I only want blessing for her. It's like she doesn't trust me enough to do what I tell her. Anybody else? And it's like, oh girl, if I could only express to you how much I love you and that I only want good for you, you'd never second guess my love. And that's the job of a parent over and over and over again to try to get their kids to understand how much they love them. But listen, that illustration, processing on that this week, here's me. I have a hard time trusting God like that. Like I have a hard time trusting that God loves me like that. Like I tend to think that God's affection towards me is is actually predicated on how I'm doing. Like if I'm honest, I I tend to think God thinks of me based on how well I'm performing for him, more than just his love for me like a parent loves a child. So so like when I have an awesome week, like I'm reading my Bible every day and I'm like, I'm sharing Christ, like I share Christ with three people this week and and I'm like super nice to my wife, even though she was a total jerk to me. (laughs) Like when that happens, when I'm a real patient father with my daughter, I can think, seriously, I can think, oh man, God must be so pumped with me right now. Like God, God must see my week and think that I'm glad I got him on my team. That can happen. But then on a bad week, like, and I get them, y'all, like on a week when I don't even pick up this thing. Like on a week when I don't share Christ with Anyone, in fact, I cussed out one guy while driving and and I probably led him further away from the Lord because I had a fathom sticker on my truck. Like when that happens and I was a jerk to Marcy, even though she was nice to me and I just blew up at my daughter. Like it's easy on those weeks to think that I've had a bad week and therefore I'm down a few notches in God's book. That like God is in some way disappointed with me. 
I come less in his favor and in his grace than I was on those awesome weeks. And as I'm processing this this week and I'm thinking about parenting, I'm thinking about this hen and these birds, and I'm thinking, I don't really understand the gospel on those weeks. I don't really understand, really know, really believe at my deepest level the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't understand how he loves us on those weeks. I mean, I talk to men specifically about this kind of stuff all the time, but I, like I talk with guys who struggle. Guys who struggle with lust. Guys who struggle with anger. Guys who struggle with pride. And they've just become, hear me, I've had this conversation with numbers of you, some of you in this room, where you just become so disheartened by having to confess and repent of the same things over and over and over, year after year after year. Anybody feel that? Anybody brave enough to say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm still confessing some of the same stuff and it feels like it's been decades. Okay, a couple of honest people, the rest of you are liars. <laughs> it's like, why can't I get past some of these things? Why am I still struggling with some of the same stuff that I struggled with when I was a teenager? What's, what's wrong with me? But then our misunderstanding of the gospel translates itself into a misapplication of the gospel because sometimes those guys mistakenly believe this. God must be tired of hearing me confess this. God must be tired of me saying the same thing over and over and over as if he is up in heaven, just kind of looking down being like, dang, when's this moron going to figure this thing out? And you know why we believe that? Why, why we believe that God gets frustrated with us? It's because as human beings, we would be. Like, we're frustrated with us when we keep screwing up the same way. And let's be real, we're frustrated with others when they can't seem to get things in line. And so we project that frustration onto God. But, 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 but you want to know the best news ever? The best news ever. Here's my one point for the sermon. He's not like us. Look at me. God's not like you. It's the best news that any of us could ever receive. He's not like us. He doesn't grow weary like us. He doesn't get exhausted like us. Look at me, he won't treat you the way that other people, including you, will treat you. He's not like us. See, we have a hard time giving ourselves mercy and therefore we mistakenly then think that God is like that, but he's not like that. He's not like us. Listen to this uh, old English pastor, Thomas Goodwin. I'll put the quote up here. This is what he says, he's a Puritan. He says this, we are apt to think that he, being so holy, is therefore of a severe and sour disposition against sinners and not able to hear them. No, he says, or says he, sorry, it's old school. No, says he, I am meek. Gentleness is my nature and temper. Y'all, He's not like us. To the very people who are rejecting him in the text and conspiring right now to kill him. He says, oh, how I would have loved to gather you. This is how he loves us. But that's just the first verse in the lament. Just two more. Let's look together at verses 38 and 39. See, 
your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's the link then to the next two chapters. Those verses link us into chapters 24 and 25 that deal with the end times, with eschatology, with the apocalypse. That's what's going on there. And those verses are prophetic. Jesus is making a prophetic pronouncement in these two verses about his death and his resurrection and then ultimately his second coming. So so that's what he's talking about. When he says, you will not see me again, that's talking about his death. He's going to the cross. You will not see me again. But then he says, until, you will not see me again until, and he's pointing forward in that prophecy to the second coming which is what the next two chapters will invest in. And so he's talking about his death, his resurrection, and then ultimately his second coming, the consummation of all things. And he says that when he returns, uh, when I do come back, you will all say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now that quote is important because it's the exact same phrase that the crowds were shouting as he came into Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 21. Here's exactly what they said. They said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So he says that, or the crowd shout that as he comes into Jerusalem. And now Jesus says, hey, everyone is going to say that when I come again. Every person is going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord because all humanity will acknowledge me for who I am when I show up again. There won't be some people who are confused. Everyone's going to know it. And, And when he comes, when they make that pronouncement, they will either rejoice with those words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, or with impending judgment, they'll say the exact same thing. Blessed is he comes in the name of the Lord. If we never come to acknowledge Jesus as Lord, then when he returns, we will experience a judgment so fierce that the the, the writer John says it will be like a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. But if we do come to him as Lord as fierce as that lion-like judgment would have been, so deep will his lamb-like tenderness be for us. How I would have gathered you. But the, the, Jesus is prophesying here, no one's gonna be neutral. Everyone will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Guys, we're gonna dig into this heavily for the next two months. So I don't have to, time to go into that too much, but this is the balance that Jesus is striking in this lament to close out this section uh, of the text. This text demonstrates the deep love of Jesus for people and his desire to be a good parent to them. Like his desire is that all would be saved, but some will reject that. Some will reject his offer of salvation and the result in rejecting Jesus is your house will be desolate. Desolation. And at the final judgment, it will depend on the decision of each individual. And that decision will determine whether they're gonna rejoice when he returns or or whether they fall before him in the face of his judgment. Now, there is one thing that I do want to point out, one last thing I want to point out about these three verses. Um, So I want you to look again back to the beginning of 37. The very first words of, of 37 say this, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That doubling is actually very important. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that doubling means something. Whenever we see a doubling of a name like that in the Bible, it means that that is being said with with, with heartfelt compassion for that person. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem represents the all of Israel who are about to reject him and even the Pharisees and the scribes, the leaders who are 
conscribing his death as we speak. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So listen, Jesus knows that the Pharisees want him dead. Jesus knows that the people are going to reject him. He is divine. He knows these things. And that same thing applies for us. He knows you. Like he knows. He, listen, he knows what you're hiding. He, he knows what you, what you did last night or last week or last month or gosh, that thing that you did so long ago that you've just kind of tucked it away and you think it's maybe gone except for when you lay on your pillow at night and think about it. Like Jesus knows that these guys are going to kill him. And instead of anger, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He, he, he moves towards them with compassion. He moves towards them in this lament. He is not like us. And, and I, I could show you, I'm, I'll just show you. Okay, this doubling is all over the Bible. You'll see it, okay, uh, in the book of Genesis. Genesis, uh, we find uh, in Genesis chapter 12, the story of Abram, also known as Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. Yeah, okay, uh, we don't have time. Uh, he, so, so, so Abram is called by God to leave his family and his home and his land and to go to an unknown place that God was calling him. And his story starts so well. He faithfully packs everything up and leaves Leave safety and security and certainty, but then it all gets screwy because he shows up in the place where God calls him and there's a famine. And so he freaks out and he runs to Egypt and he tries to pawn off his wife as a sister to protect his own skin. Remember that story? Then you think he grows up a little bit, but he does it again to another guy, tries to hand his wife off to save his own skin. And then even when he starts to get a, he and Sarah get a little bit impatient waiting for a son to come. He ends up sleeping with her servant, a gal named Hagar, to produce a child named Ishmael. I mean, these guys need serious marriage counseling. That's what we read in the book of Genesis. But finally, in their old age, God provides them with a promised son, a boy named Isaac. Isaac, okay? Uh, and in Genesis chapter 22, God commands Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac on the top of Mount Moriah. You know this story. This is a test to see if Abraham would take matters into his own hands once again and not trust the Lord. And so early in the morning, they get up and they make the hike up the mountain and Abraham binds Isaac to the wooden altar. And just as he pulls out the knife and is reaching to kill his only son, Genesis twenty two eleven says, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. In Exodus, uh, we find the story of Moses. Moses was born to an Israelite mother. Uh, it is illegal to have baby boys at this time who are Israelites. And so she saves his life by getting him to be raised in the palace by the daughter of Pharaoh as a prince of Egypt. Right, you've seen this movie? cartoon, okay? Uh, he, he receives the very best education while he is uh, living in the palace. He is among the socially elite, but in a fit of rage, when he sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite slave, the text says these exact words, that Moses looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. That's Mo. Killed a guy with his bare hands and tried to dispose of the body in the sand. Well, he thinks that he's covered it up, but it comes out the next day that someone did indeed witness that murder. Moses freaks out, runs for his life, and for the next 40 years, he lives in the land of Midian as a fugitive. 40 years until Exodus 3. Moses is out keeping his flock. And he sees a bush that is burning and yet not consumed. Verse four, 
When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. We don't have to do Old Testament. There's more I could show you, but let's keep going. New Testament, okay? This happens there, Luke chapter 10, okay? Uh, Jesus shows up to a friend of his home, a guy named Lazarus. Shows up to Lazarus' house. Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and a woman named Martha. They welcome him in, and the text says that Martha was busy serving and distracted and anxious, and the text says troubled by many things. But then the text says that Mary just sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his teaching. Well, that doesn't set right with Martha. That ticks Martha off. Any Marthas in here who are like, why am I doing all the work, right? Martha's, it's okay, safe place to admit that. Martha is ticked off, so she does what any reasonable person does. She rebukes Jesus. She, literally, read the text. She confronts Jesus. She doesn't confront Mary. She says to Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care that my sister has left all the work for me to do? Tell her to help me. Which, by the way, don't command Jesus to do anything. It's bad protocol. Tell her to help me. Verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. And listen, I could go on. We, 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 we'd be remiss if we didn't mention Peter. I mean, Peter is a man of incredible faith. Peter is, is like the primary apostle. He left his job and his family to follow Jesus. He was the first to openly confess who Jesus was at Caesarea Philippi. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He's the only disciple either dumb enough or, or faithful enough to step out of that boat and try to walk on water to Jesus. I mean, this guy, if there's varsity, he plays quarterback. But on the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter denies even knowing him three times within earshot of Jesus. It's like Jesus is back there and he's like, I don't even know him. And John's gospel says, in that moment, Jesus locks eyes with him. And it was only hours earlier that Peter had said these very words to Jesus. Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison. I'm ready to go with you to prison and even to death. That's Bible for Jesus. I'm your ride or die. Like I'm all in. I'll go with you to the very ends of the earth. And here's what Jesus so kindly said to Peter before he is going to deny him three times. He says this, verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, this is referring to his restoration, when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Did you see what's going on in the Bible? Every single one of these faithful people had some sort of fumble or some sort of distraction or even some unbelievably heinous sin. You kill a guy with your hands and bury him in the sand, you're disqualified. And to each one, God approaches with compassion. Listen, he's not like us. Moses, Moses, Martha, Martha, Peter, Peter. That's, that's, that's how God loves us. And he does it in our text to the very men who are going to kill him. When he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he moves towards them in compassion. And here's my hunch. It's a hunch. Can't prove it biblically, but here's my hunch. Uh, I think Jesus would still have gathered them under his wing if they were willing. Even after all they had done. I think he would still gather them under his wing. I think Jesus loves even the hated Pharisees. 
I, and I can't prove that, but I can, I can give you some compelling evidence that might back that up. There's one more doubling that I wanna point out. After Jesus' death, after his resurrection, and after his ascension into heaven, the early church comes under uh, an incredible persecution. They are persecuted first at the hands of the Jews and then at the hands of the Romans. But at the hands of the Jews, specifically the Pharisees, there is a hand of one zealous young Pharisee that seems to trump them all, and, and it's a guy named Saul. And in Acts chapter 8, it says that Saul was ravaging the church, dragging men and women out of their homes and putting them in prison and even approving of the execution of Christians. But then in Acts chapter nine, Saul is on a horse riding on the road to a city called Damascus to, by the way, arrest more Christians. He's got papers in hand to rip more people out of their homes and put more of them in prison and ultimately to death when a light from heaven shines on him and he is knocked from his horse. And verse four says, falling to the ground, Saul heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. One of Saul's favorite titles for himself before this moment was that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That means he's the elite of the elite of the hated group of hypocritical Pharisees. He is the top dog. He has hunted down, persecuted, and killed Christians until in a moment, Saul, Saul. See, like, like this kind of compassion, this kind of mercy, the love of Jesus that's on display right here, it it, it bends the mind, right? Like it's a category that I can't personally get my head around. If some, listen, if somebody drug you out of your house and murdered you, I would have a really hard time stepping towards them with compassion. This kind of love is foreign to us. He's, he is not like us. And this same Saul, later renamed Paul, will write a chapter in a book called Romans, chapter five, which is confusing. But in chapter five, he says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So church, right here, what happens all too often is that when we screw up, when we sin, what happens all too often is we run. Like we run from him. Like when we sin, when we fall short, even, even sometimes when we just kind of grow stale and cold, we run from him because we think he's, he's disappointed. We run from him because we think he's angry with us. We run from him because we think he's done with us, that we've, he, we drew the short straw, that, that he's just so upset. We run from him because, listen, we actually think he's like us. But he's not. He's not like us. That's the best news in the whole world. God's not like you. And I just felt this week, like, like if, if you've done that, if you've run from him, or maybe you are currently on the run, you can run to church. You can hide from him right here. If you're there, I want to appeal to you to turn back. That's what the word repent means. It means to turn, to change directions. I want you to turn back because his, his love is more. 
His compassion is more. His mercy for you is, is more. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Listen to me. His mercy, his mercy for you does not diminish when you sin. It actually increases. In those moments when you sin, he sides with you against your sin, not against you with your sin. He hates your sin, but he, but he loves you more. So run to him. Run to him. I've done my part. Seriously, that's all I can do. That's as a, like a, as a preacher, I proclaim the excellencies of Christ and then I've got to just give the rest to you. I've got to like leave it to you. Like, like, hear me, you have to move towards him. I've just told you he's moving towards you. You have to move towards him. He's moving towards you with compassion. Wouldn't you turn to him? Wouldn't you trust him? Like a parent to a child, trust that he loves you. It doesn't matter how far, far off course you are. His mercy is more than that. How I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. But you are not willing. Friends, are you willing? Repent. Run to him. That's how he loves us. Let's pray. Father, it is good to hear these words, even three small, seemingly insignificant words that transition us from one part of Matthew's gospel to the next, and yet they are so filled with your heart. Lord, it, it baffles my mind that this is how you love us. It baffles my mind that while we were dead in our sin, while we were yet sinners, while we were your enemies, Christ died for us. When we were at our absolute worst, he sacrificed himself and he said, that one is mine, that one is mine. And God, I need to hear that as a Christian every day, every hour. I need to believe more and more that this is who you are and this is how you see us. And it's also, Lord, for someone who's not a Christian who needs to hear that and remember that and know that and be saved by that. So your mercy is enough today for each one of us. Your mercy is enough to save and your mercy is enough to sanctify and your mercy is enough to sustain each one. And so Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, I'm not the one who's preaching. You're the one who's preaching to our hearts. Speak to our hearts. There's some sin. There's some hidden sin in hearts here. Lord, I pray that that would be confessed and repented, not because you're tired of hearing it, but because you delight in hearing it and you side with us against those sins. I pray for courage for my brothers and sisters in here to confess those things, to turn from those things, to run to you again. Lord, thank you for your unbelievable kindness, your unbelievable grace, and your unbelievable mercy for us. We worship you. We adore you. And Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus and the power of the Spirit.